Hey guys, Ms. Marie Sick here, and in this video we're going to start to talk about different ways that we could express the rate of a reaction. Now, the rate of a chemical reaction would really be the speed at which collisions are occurring over time. The problem with that is that it's really hard to measure collisions occurring over time because we don't have any kind of binoculars or microscope where we could look into a reaction and actually count every collision that's taking place. So instead of doing that, what we tend to do is measure changes in molarity, either uh, how a molarity of a reactant is decreasing over time or how the molarity of a product is increasing over time. And by seeing how quickly that molarity is changing, we could get an idea of the speed of that chemical reaction. Now I will say this, you could measure a reactant or a product, but it is more common to measure how reactants are changing. Now our official formula for doing this is that the rate is equal to the change in the molarity of a substance. So again, the brackets here indicate molarity over the change in time. So you could do this for various time segments. Um, you could either use seconds or minutes or whatever you chose to use. Now, depending on what you use would depend on then on what unit you would report. Um, so the rate of a chemical reaction is typically expressed in units of molarity per second. This is by far the most common one. Um, but you could do molarity per minute. That's acceptable too. Or if we remember that molarity is equal to moles over liters, you could see that substitution in here, or they could rewrite this in a really fancy way and say moles times liters to the negative first times seconds to the negative first. Technically, all of these units kind of show the same idea of that change in concentration versus the change in time that would be taking place. Now, let's talk about how these would look graphically. So what we're going to see here is an example of a reaction of reactant A changing over into product B. And they give us some beakers here of this process taking place. So you notice we're starting off with lots of reactant here. And as the reaction proceeds further and further along, it eventually is changing all over to the green product B. So A here is the purple and the B here would be the green. Um, so to see this in a graph, what you'll notice here is that on this axis we have number of molecules. Now you could use molarity there as well. It's some indication of the concentration. Um, down here you have time and for this one they're measuring it in terms of seconds. And so what we see is the purple curve here represents how A is decreasing over time. And this curve going up in green is how B is increasing over time. So again, reactants are being used up over time. And so you will always notice their concentrations decreasing on these graphs. So if you ever wanted to pick out a reactant on a graph like this, you would be looking for a curve that's going down. On the flip side, products are being made over time. And so those concentrations should be increasing. So if you're ever trying to pick out a product on these graphs, you're looking for something that's going up. But you notice it's making kind of an exponential curve here. It's not a straight line. And so if we think about this idea that rate equals the change in concentration over the change in time. Let's kind of evaluate here what's going on with our reactant A. You notice in the first 10 seconds here, we're going from about 50 to maybe about 25. So we're changing 25 molecules over 10 seconds. But now look at the next 10 seconds. From 10 to 20, we change from 25 to maybe about 10. So that only changed 15 molecules over the 10 seconds. The next 10 seconds from 20 to 30, we're going from 10 down to about 5. So now we're only changing by 5 molecules over that course of 10 seconds. So you notice that the rate values have the largest magnitude at the beginning of the reaction. That's where we're getting the most drastic changes in concentrations. Now that's important to remember because you'll see as we get further along into this unit that most of the time when we're doing rate calculations, 
calculations. We care about what the rate is doing at the beginning of these processes because that's where we see the most change occurring. As this reaction gets further and further along, as that reaction is finishing up, we see less and less change occurring. And so therefore, we're not getting significant changes in concentrations anymore. So it's a lot harder to notate rate at that point. So most of the time on these problems, we care about an initial rate. What's our rate doing here at the beginning of this process? Now, the reason why our reaction rates decrease in magnitude over time has to do with the way that we're utilizing things. Remember, as the reaction proceeds, the concentration of reactants decreases. We're getting less and less reactants in that container. And so they're having a harder and harder time of finding each other and pairing up to make product. It's kind of like if you can imagine uh, people at a dance and they say, hey, everybody needs to find a new partner. Well, initially, everybody finds partners really quick, but then you end up with like people scattered here and there that don't have a partner. And it takes them a while while to find each other and join up if they're so separated and trying to find each other. So the less concentration there is, the less reactant available to collide and make product, that rate is going to significantly slow down as that reaction proceeds. Now, it says here because the reaction rate changes with time and because the rate is different depending on which reactant our product is being studied, we must be very specific when we describe a rate for a chemical reaction. On the example that we saw in the previous page, on that graph, um, they only had one reactant and one product. So it was kind of obvious what was going on. But let's say you had a reaction where you had two reactants. Both reactants could have a different rate of disappearance to them depending on the stoichiometry of the overall reaction. So whenever we clarify who has what rate, we always want to state, hey, reactant A has this rate. Reactant B has this rate. Reactant C has this rate. We want to be very specific on what that rate is for. Now, it says here that one of the ways we can experimentally get the data on the graphs is actually through Beer's Law. If you remember back with Beer's Law, what we were doing is we could use absorbance levels to measure molarity. Well, if you measure how absorbance changes over time, you can measure how molarity changes over time. And so therefore, you could get the information you needed um, from one of these rate law graphs. So Beer's Law is one of the experimental ways we can get our data. Now, I mentioned just a minute ago that we really care what's happening at the beginning of our reaction. And I want to kind of re-emphasize why. It says here that rate is typically determined as the change in reactant concentration over time. For a graph of concentration versus time, the rate would be the slope of the graph. And I kind of did that earlier with y'all when we said, hey, back on this part, as I go from 50 to 25, that's a change of 25 over the course of 10 seconds. And then the next one was a change in 15 over the next 10 seconds. What I was doing there is kind of a, you know, rise over run situation where I was calculating the slope at those various points. So in essence, a rate is a slope of one of those curved graphs. Okay. Now it says here, however, since the graph changes over time, remember it's a lot more sloped at the beginning than it is at the end, then that means the slope also changes over the course of the graph or reaction. So we have some kind of specific rates that we can talk about. First off, the slope of a line tangent to the curve at any given point is called instantaneous rate. So I could take an instantaneous rate at 10 seconds, at 20 seconds, at 30 seconds. I could take an instantaneous rate wherever. However, if I take the instantaneous rate at a time of zero, right at the beginning when everything is changing by a whole bunch, that is what is called the initial rate. Now, as I mentioned earlier, initial rate is often the one that we care about the most because that's where we're getting lots of changes to happen at. And so that's where we're going to have some measurable change occurring that we can actually calculate with. So most of the time when we are calculating rate law experiments, 
we are going to be using initial rates. You're going to hear that term used a lot within this unit. And the reason why is if we wait too long during a reaction to measure concentration changes, as we saw in those graphs, they tend to start to flatten out. And the reason why is we're starting to reach what is called equilibrium, where no rate changes will be seen at that point anymore. So for example here, they gave us a reaction here and they gave us a curve of the concentration of this reactant C4H9Cl changing. You can see it decreases, which is consistent with it being on the reactant side. Okay, um, if I took the slope of the line right at the beginning here, we would call that an initial rate. But if I took the slope of the line wherever, I would just have an instantaneous rate, but I would need to specify what time it was at because that would be different. The instantaneous rate at t equals 600 seconds would be different than the instantaneous rate, say, at 300 seconds or at 100 seconds. All of those would have a different rate. Um, and as one more reminder, reactants are always going to curve down because they decrease over time. Products are always going to curve up because they increase over time. And we notice here that eventually they do flatten out as I've used up all those reactants and stuff. And so we end up reaching equilibrium where rates are no longer changing. We're going to be talking a lot more about these graphs over the course of the next couple classes, including um, how these graphs would be altered based on what kind of balanced reaction I have. If something has a different coefficient than another reaction, that impacts what these curves would look like. Um, however, for today, what I want you to be familiar with are the terms of instantaneous rate, knowing that if the rate is taken right at the beginning, we call that an initial rate, and being able to look at one of these graphs and being able to figure out who is the reactant and who is the product based on if it's increasing or decreasing. If you can kind of do those things for right now, you're in good shape, and I promise we're going to work a lot more with these over the course of the next couple days. All right, hopefully you're feeling good about dealing with uh, reaction rates. If you have any questions or need any help, please feel free to email me. Bye guys.